Well, let me welcome you to our online service here at Charleston Community Church. It's great to have you tuned in with us as we look at God's Word together. And we're going to be continuing our series looking through the book of Exodus. We're going to be in Exodus chapter 19 and 20, if you want to get ready for that. It's the story of the Ten Commandments, a huge point in the book of Exodus and indeed the whole Bible. I'm so very excited to be looking at that with you. Let me just say something about the recent announcement from the Scottish Government. We are uh, disappointed by this announcement, by its vagueness and I guess by the lack of respect for churches. Um, uh, what the announcement means for us as a church here is that we are not allowed to open for Sunday service until 5th of April. Um, so we're, we're hoping the Scottish Government will push that back a day so that we can open on Easter Sunday and the 4th of April and we've got some events lined up for that God willing and most of it will be online because the restrictions will still be in place but we're hoping come Easter to do a three-week series on hope and we'd love for you to tune in and to invite your friends invite others in the scheme to watch it online and to discuss it um, but in, in the meantime I realize a lot of us will be feeling quite down about that announcement another month of lockdown um, if you need any help or any support, please do reach out to us and get in contact with us. If you're here in Charleston, uh, all the information should be on the front of the church so that you can email us and we will make sure that we can help you as best as we can in this time. It's a really difficult time, uh, but I guess the encouragement is that now we've got a date to look forward to um, and we will get through this together. So um, please do reach out if you need help or prayer support. We're going to begin our service today by praying. We're going to pray as we usually do for a country and for a church that we are partnered with. We're going to pray for the country of Ethiopia. There's been a lot of violence in the northern part of Ethiopia and so we want to pray for the people who have been affected by that and for the church in that country. Uh, Ethiopia has round about 84 million people and it has one of the oldest churches in history. Um, it really is astonishing what God has done in that country. And so we want to give thanks for that and pray for protection for the church in that nation. And we're also going to pray for Nidri Community Church. Nidri is the church that um, really started 20 Schemes, the organization that we are part of. We're going to pray for um, all the folks there, for Mez McConnell and Andy Constable, the ministers, and for the work that they are doing this time uh, during the COVID lockdown. So let's begin our service then by praying. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the gospel. Thank you that Jesus has saved us from our sins, that he is the savior, that he is the king of the world. Thank you that all things are under your control. Father, we are disheartened by um, this lockdown and by the continued uh, effects that it is having. We are disheartened um, at having to remain isolated for yet another month and not see each other. We know that your church needs to be together. Um, we know that people need community. They need contact. They need support. Um, and yet, Father, we um, take hope in the fact that you are in control, that you are the God who is sitting on the throne. And Father, nothing happens outside your will. And we remember today as we pray to you that you have dealt with our biggest problem. The sin that separates us from you has been dealt with. Jesus has dealt with that on the cross. Thank you for Jesus. Father, we admit to you that we are sinners. And we admit broken by that fact, but also taking comfort in the knowledge that you will forgive us of our sins. Not because we deserve it, but because Jesus has dealt with it. So we praise you, Lord, for him. We want to pray for your church, Lord, across the world. We pray especially uh, for your church in Ethiopia. We pray for the victims of those in Aksum who have been, uh, uh, who have had to suffer under this military attack, Lord. We pray for the families of those who have lost loved ones in that massacre in that city. Father, we ask that peace and justice would be seen in that country. And we pray for your church in Ethiopia, Lord. Thank you for the, the great revival that's happened there recently. And we pray that that growth would continue. We pray for unity for your church in that nation. And we pray, Lord, that 
the church in Ethiopia would have a big vision for mission, not just in Ethiopia, but across the whole Horn of Africa. Would you bring many more souls into your kingdom through that church's witness, we pray. Lord, closer to home, we want to pray for our brothers and sisters in Nidri Community Church. Thank you for Mez McConnell and for Andy Constable and for others there that are laboring tirelessly to get the gospel out in that scheme. Father, thank you for what you have done. It's incredible that the people that you have rescued and the work that you have done in that church over the, the past few years. Lord, we pray for them as they seek to continue to reach that community in this time of lockdown. Thank you that they are able to provide meals for over 40 different households. Lord, we pray that as they practically show the love of Jesus, would that give opportunities to talk about the gospel. Father, thank you for these evangelistic Zoom meetings that they've been having with many non-Christians attending. We pray that souls would be saved and brought into your kingdom. And Father, would you build that church up and continue to encourage those who follow you there? Would they have a deepening knowledge of the love of Christ? And would you use them for your kingdom at Nidri and beyond? Father, be with us now as we study your word. Speak to us. Help us understand what we're going to learn today as we look at the Ten Commandments. And Father, would it challenge us and would it encourage us? And would we see Jesus as we study your word? We pray this in his name. Amen. Well, Phil is going to do our first reading. He's going to read from Exodus chapter 19. Uh, it's a bit of a, a wacky chapter. <laughs> but it is uh, really important. So Phil's going to read Exodus chapter 19, and then I will pick up the reading in chapter 20. Good morning. This week's reading comes from Exodus chapter 19. On the third new moon, after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. They set out from Rephidim and came into the wilderness of Sinai, and they encamped in the wilderness there Israel encamped before the mountain, while Moses went up to God. The Lord called him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you should say to the house of Jacob, and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. All the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am coming to you in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with you, and may also believe you forever. When Moses told the words of the people to the Lord, the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people, and consecrate them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their garments, and be ready for the third day. For on the third day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai, in the sight of all the people. And you shall set limits for the people all around, saying, Take care not to go up into the mountain or touch the edge of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall be put to death. No hand shall touch him, but he shall be stoned or shot. Whether beast or man, he shall not live. When the trumpet sounds a long blast, they shall come up to the mountain. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and consecrated the people, and they washed their garments. And he said to the people, Be ready for the third day. Do not go near a woman. On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like smoke of a kiln and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him in the thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, 
And the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down and warn the people, lest they break through to the Lord to look, and many of them perish. Also, let the priests who come near to the Lord consecrate themselves, lest the Lord break out against them. And Moses said to the Lord, The people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for you yourself warned us, saying, Set limits around the mountain and consecrate it. And the Lord said to him, Go down and come up bringing Aaron with you. But do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to the Lord, lest he break out against them. So Moses went down to the people and told them. Okay, folks, let me uh, continue our reading in Exodus, picking up at chapter 20. So you want to grab your Bibles again, open it up to Exodus chapter 20, and I'm going to read from verse 1 to 21. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or in the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. 
but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labour and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honour your father and your mother, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbour. You shall not covet your neighbour's house. You shall not covet your neighbour's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbour. When the people saw the thunder and the lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain in smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, Speak to us yourself and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. The people remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. Let me just pray briefly as we look at these two chapters of Exodus together. Father, we ask that you would speak to us today through your word, by the power of your Holy Spirit. You are the great, awesome, majestic, eternal creator God. And you are not silent. You spoke all those years ago at Sinai. And you speak today through your Bible. So please speak to us now, Father. Build us up, encourage us, challenge us, and help us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Right, let's fire in. There's a lot going on in these chapters of Exodus. Lots of noise and fire and trumpets and running up and down mountains. And the most significant moment of all that we just read, the giving of the Ten Commandments. And with everything that's going on here, I think we could say that the key point of this passage is that this is the teaching that God is going to give Israel on how they are to live distinctly as his people. God is coming to, to be with his people and he wants them to be different from the other nations round about them. Uh, that's the story of the book of Exodus. The first 18 chapters were the story of the great rescue. How God rescued them out of Egypt and brought them to this moment of Sinai. And in the second half of the book from chapter 19 onwards is the story of the great relationship. The story of how God is coming down to live with Israel and to set them apart as his chosen nation. And they are to be distinct as his people. So think about how we like to show distinctives today. This year, hopefully, Scotland will play England in the Euro 2020 Championship. And you can guarantee that when the Tartan army go down to Wembley, uh, if they're allowed, they will want to make it known that they're Scottish. They'll want people to know where they're from and whose side they're on. And that will involve wearing kilts, uh, singing songs about Maradona and putting some washing up liquid in the fountains in Trafalgar Square. That will mark them out as distinctively Scottish. Well, Israel is to be distinct as God's chosen people, not by what they wear, but by how they live. And that's relevant for us today because God's people are no longer a, a single nation like they were in the book of Exodus. Now it is everyone who follows Jesus across the world. They are God's people. And so there's to be a difference between those who are in a relationship with God and those who are not. There's to be a difference between the church and the world. And in this passage, I think we see what that is. How... How Jesus can not only save you, but how he can change you. And how he does that in a way that can never make you feel proud or arrogant. Now, at Sinai, we see that God wants his people to live this way so that, they, so that they'll stand out. 
So just look with me um, back at chapter 19, verse 3, how, how this begins. Look at what God says. This is what he says. Then Moses went up to God and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So God says, look, I've saved you. I've redeemed you. Now I want you to listen to me and obey me. And if you do that, you're going to stand out from the rest of the world. You'll be my treasured possession. Although I own the whole world, you will be my treasured possession. You'll be a, a kingdom of priests. What does that mean? Uh, well, priests in the Old Testament are not like the priests that we see today. Um, you know, with the robes and the collars. A uh, priest in the Old Testament was, was like the representative of God to the people. And so God's saying to them here, when you obey me, it's like you're representing me to the whole world. You're a holy nation. You're going to be a people that are set apart. Now, what's interesting is that when we get to the New Testament, the Apostle Peter takes these very words and he applies them to the church of Jesus. So this is what he says in 1 Peter 2 verse 9. This is what he says to us today in the church. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. If you follow Jesus, that is who you are now in God's eyes. Man, we could just uh, just stop looking at the rest of Exodus and just camp out in these verses uh, for for 20 minutes because there's so much wonderful truth in there. That's how God views you. He chose you. You're You're his special possession. You may have spent your whole life feeling that you've been mistreated or marginalized, but if you come to Jesus in God's eyes, you are, you are a treasure to him. You are his priesthood. You are his, his holy nation. You, you're, you're there to represent him to the world. I bet you didn't realize that, that you're like a priest. Jesus has brought you out of darkness into his wonderful light. And you show that change. You show that that's true by how you live. So so we are to be distinct as Christians, like Israel was to be distinct here in the book of Exodus. And there's three things, I think, that mark out this distinctiveness that we see here and that we should see in the church today. God's people, um, the first distinctive is that God's people are rescued by grace. Second distinctive is that God's people are to obey his word. And the third distinctive is that God's people are to trust in their mediator. That third one sounds a bit weird. Don't worry, we'll get to that and we'll explain what it means. First one though, God's people have been rescued by grace. It's the first distinctive. They have been rescued by grace. So, At Sinai, God is about to give his law to Israel. But here's what we must understand. And this is is so important. The law is given after he saves his people. What this means is that, that they are not saved by keeping these rules. They they are saved already. Therefore, they are to keep the rules. So in that bit that we read in chapter 19, uh, verse 4, God says, I rescued you. I I brought you up out of Egypt like an eagle carries her babies and protects them. I I carried you. I saved you. I cared for you. God did all that. They did nothing. Remember, we've we've seen what Israel's like. They're, They're a bunch of whingers for the most part. It's nothing to do with them. God did it all for them. Therefore, Chapter 19, verse 5, obey my law. 
See, because you have been saved, I want you to obey. It's not obeying to be saved, it's obey because you are saved. Um, And the actual, the Ten Commandments themselves make that same point. You know, the Ten Commandments don't actually begin with the first commandment. There's a bit before that, we could call it the zeroth, zeroth commandment. Have a look at verse 2 of chapter 20. God begins by saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. So before the rules, God reminds Israel, look, you're already saved. You are free. These rules are not given to earn my favor. They are given because you have my favor. We are saved by grace, by what God has done, not by what we do. Now, I said that's so important because most people today, if we were to go out in the scheme and you ask people, you know, what, what do you think makes you a Christian? Most people will talk about all the stuff that you have to do to be a Christian. So you've got to go to church, or you've got to pray, or you've got to confess your sins to the priest, or, or go to mass, or, uh, and then if you do these things, then God will accept you. Or if you're a good person, then God will accept you. That's how you become a Christian. That could not be further from the truth. There is nothing that we do to make God accept us. We are, we are way, way too messed up for that. I'm way too messed up for that. We're all sinners. And no amount of good deeds is going to change that. We cannot save ourselves from our sins. We can't do anything to save ourselves. The good news of the gospel is, though, that Jesus does it all for us. Jesus suffered the punishment for our wrong as he was crucified so that we could be set free. We don't deserve to be saved, but he has done that for us anyway. So, so see, if, if you're looking into Christianity right now, please do not think this. Do not think, I need to sort my life out before I come to Jesus. That is not what following him is about. Come as you are with all your sins. Give them to Jesus. He will pay the price for them. He will suffer the consequence for them and you will be set free. Not because you are good, but because he is good. We're saved by grace, not by what we do. But God has saved us for a purpose. That purpose is so that we can be with him. And he wants us, as people already free, to live in obedience with him. That's what it means to be in in this relationship with him, that we live in obedience. And that's the second distinctive we see about God's people. They're to obey his word. Do you know, in the Bible, it's quite rare for God to, to actually speak to all the people at once. Often he speaks through prophets in the Old Testament, In the New Testament, he speaks through Jesus, the the last and final word of revelation. Um, But when he does speak collectively to all the people, it means that we need to to sit up and take note of what he's saying. And that's what he does here in the Ten Commandments. In Exodus, usually the way it works is God speaks to Moses and then Moses relays that message to the people. But when he gives the Ten Commandments, he gathers everyone and he speaks to all of them because this is so significant. This is timeless. These commandments are hugely important. And in the New Testament, Jesus emphasizes the importance of all of these commandments. This is how we are to live as his people, as those rescued by grace. Uh, This is not how we become free. Just we need to remind ourselves of that. But this is how we live free. And so the commandments themselves are split into two. Um, The first four are about how we relate to God and the latter six are about how we relate to um, others. Now, we could go through each of these. Each of these commandments is a sermon in and of themselves. So we're not going to have time to go into all the detail here. We're going to try just hover above all 10 of them and try and get the big picture. But if you do follow Jesus, ask yourself, Where am I falling short in each of these commandments? And as we go through this, ask yourself, how can I honour Jesus more this week and seeking to obey them? 
Let these commandments lead us to repentance and to working hard at seeking to obey God in them. So let's look through them. Uh, Chapter 20, verse 3. Uh, These are the commandments that are all, the first four commandments, like I said, are all to do about how we live distinctly in relation to God. And the first commandment, chapter 20, verse 3, is the most important one. You shall have no other gods before me. Now, it makes sense that this is the first commandment. Think about this in the context of God establishing a relationship with his people. So I'm married um, and when I met Kyrene and when we got engaged, I didn't first, um, I, I didn't meet her and then begin by creating a list of rules and saying, right, here Kyrene, here's your rules, you've got to keep them. I can tell you with confidence that that is not a good way to start a relationship. Um, And actually it can often be a form of abuse that many people will have experienced, very controlling. These are these rules that you've got to keep for me to like you. That's not how God works. Remember, saved first, loved first. Nevertheless, there are expectations that both Kyrie and I have of each other. And the big expectation that we have is, is ultimately loyalty. We promised, we made a promise to each other that we would be faithful to each other alone. That's a law that we live by, but that's not restrictive. That, there's something about, actually, that's freeing. Loyalty is such an important part of any relationship. And God is God, and therefore, we are to put nothing else in his place. He is to be number one. Simple question then, is Jesus the number one priority in your life? And if he is, would people be able to look at you and to say, yeah, Jesus is number one in their life? The theologian Martin Luther once said that you do not break any of the other nine commandments without first of all breaking this one first. So think about it, right? This is the most important commandment. Any of the other commandments are broken by breaking this one first, right? Think, think about lying, for example, the ninth commandment, you shall not bear false witness, tell lies. The reason you tell lies usually is that you're trying to make yourself look good. And the reason you want to make yourself look good is because the most important thing in your life is not God, but your own reputation. And so not only have you broken ninth commandment, but you've broken the first one because you have put your reputation in the place of God. God has to be the number one. And these four first four commandments really emphasize that. Uh, the command to not commit idolatry in verse 4 to 6 is a command about the way that we worship God. Um, we are not to use images that detract for him, from him. In other words, we are to worship God in the way that he has told us, not the way that we want. Uh, a painting of God is a horrible thing. Because... Think about what that does. It reduces him down. It almost makes out that he is like one of us. And we dare not do that. And it's not just out there, but but maybe in how we think about God, we're in danger of idolatry. We're in danger of reducing him to someone we're more comfortable with rather than letting his word shape our understanding of him. So the first two commandments are about what we think in regards to God. Uh, The third one, if you have a look at that, in verse 7 is about what we say about God. The way we speak about God is to be done in a way that shows respect, in a way that honours the name that we carry. We, We speak the name of God, we speak the name of Jesus with honour and respect. We do not use his name as a swear word. But it's more than that. It's something like, I mean, to be a Christian means to be a Christ one. We, we carry Jesus' name. And so in all our speech, we need to conduct ourselves in a way that shows that we really honour Jesus. It's what we think. It's in what we say. 
and it's also in what we do for God. The fourth commandment there um, in verse 8 to 11 on keeping the the Sabbath, that's what that's about. There's a, a lot of creation language in these verses. And so what this commandment is saying is that we are to live in a way that's reflecting our creator. And what that meant for Israel was having a day, um, which was a Saturday for them, in which they would rest and enjoy God. Now for the church today, it is about resting in Jesus, which we do every day when we study him in his word. It's about looking to our eternal rest but it is also about setting aside that day, which for us is Sunday, the Lord's Day. We set aside this day to, to come together as his church to rest, to rest in, in who he is and to have a rest and worship together. And so the point of these commandments is to show that our thoughts, our words, our deeds are to reflect to the world the God that we follow. He is to be the controlling access of the Christian's life. Do you know, Jesus takes all these commandments, these first four commandments, and I think he sums it up very simply this way. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Everything about us is to be built in love towards him. People should be able to look at this church and know that there are a group of people, some of them might be a bit weird, some crackpots here, but you know what? They really love Jesus. The next six commandments are about how we live distinctly in relation to others. Um, that's what matters to God as well, not just that, I guess we could say the vertical axis, but the horizontal axis. And it begins with family life in verse 12. Honour your father and mother. Um, please don't think that this is a command just for children. This is a command for all of us who still have parents. We are to honour them. Um, maybe that means phoning them, just being in touch with them, respecting them. Now this is, a, this is kind of where I wish we could just stop and spend a bit of time, but for time's sake we can't because I, this is a loaded commandment, I think in our context especially. Some of us have had great parents that we love, great mum or dad, but many of us and many folks around here have grown up in abusive homes. I just want to just say that this is not an excuse for submission to abusive parents where you need to get the law involved, where you need to get others involved. What this commandment does show is that God does value family. And even if we have complex relationships, even if it's difficult, where appropriate, we need to honour family. Then we get um, commandments number six through seven in verse 13 and 14 there. Do not murder and do not commit adultery. Now, we may have been going through these commandments and kind of thinking, gosh, I keep breaking these. You know, I, I see myself on the other side of a lot of these commandments. And then you get to these ones and you think, oh, well, at least I've not broken these ones. I've not killed anyone and I've not committed adultery. Now, some of you watching this may have done that. But just so you know, regardless of where you are on that, Jesus won't let any of us off the hook. Um, in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 5 and 7, Jesus talks about these commandments and he raises the bar of what they mean. And so he says this, if you have ever hated someone in your heart, you've committed murder. So have you ever been filled with anger and hatred for anyone? Then you've broken this commandment. He says, if you've ever looked at someone lustfully, then you've broken the commandment not to commit adultery. That means lusting after others in your mind. It means looking at pornography or engaging in other forms of sexual immorality. Now, do you see, both these commandments relate to how we view others. Like if we hate someone or lust after them sexually, what we do in these circumstances is often dehumanize them. They become a mere object, either an object of hate or an object of lust. Of course, they're not objects. They are people made in the image of God. That's why we, we don't think of them like that. 
But what we tend to do, especially with these uh, later com- latter commandments, is um, we often jump to the extreme examples without thinking about how we see the more subtle forms in our life. So stealing, for example. And we've got a lot of folks in Charleston that love a wee five-finger discount. Um, and maybe you've not done that, you've not shoplifted, you've not done any robbing, you've not bumped any cars. But stealing could also be not paying a parking ticket, downloading that pirated movie. And notice again in the second half how it deals with our thoughts and our words and our deeds. Our deeds are the focus of verse 12 to 15. Then our words in verse 16, we are not to speak lies or to gossip against others. You know, it's bearing false witness. Man, that's a big one. And finally, our thoughts in verse 17, we are not to be greedy uh, and to covet. To covet means to envy. It's wanting something that's not yours, that belongs to your neighbour. All this has a focus on how we treat others. Jesus summed up this half of the law. He, he took it and he summed it up by saying this, love your neighbour as yourself. If we do that, we won't treat others like this. Love God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength and love your neighbour as yourself. Now, I want us just to step back from these commands. Do you feel the weight of them? When you get under the skin, do you feel the weight of this? Don't Don't dare disregard this if you're a Christian. This is is the God who thunders from the top of Mount Sinai who spoke this. It's really serious. Don't disregard it. That's the first mistake we could make with this is we just put it to one side and say, oh, Jesus will forgive me. That is not how people who have been forgiven by Jesus treat this. It means you're not saved if you did that. But the second mistake that we can make is that we use these commandments to gauge our salvation. Remember, these are not rules we want to obey in order for God to accept us. These are rules we must obey because God has already accepted us. This is what we strive for as Christians, but at the same time, we need to let the law show us how far we fall short. Um, The Apostle Paul says that the law of God is like a school teacher that teaches us how sinful we are as we see the filth of our sin in comparison to God's standard. Let me tell you, I have broken every single one of these commandments multiple times. And Before I was a Christian, I might have thought I was a good guy, but when I see God's holy standard, I see how far I've fallen short. And that shows, I think, why this passage is so terrifying. Did you notice that? It, when God's people receive the law, it's not, oh, this is all wonderful. Let's all hold hands and sing songs about how great it is that our God's coming to be with us. The dominant emotion in this passage is fear. And so what God's people need is not just the law, but they need a mediator. This is the third point. God's people trust in their mediator. Let me just explain what's going on. Now, in chapter 19, God is wanting to come down and be with his people. But did you notice as Phil was reading that, um, how, how unapproachable God seems to be? So in chapter 19, verse 11, he says he's going to come down on Sinai on the third day, but no one is to go near that mountain as he comes down on the mountain. And if anyone touches it, then they are to be shot or stoned to death. You cannot come near God. And when he does come, there's smoke and fire and thunder and it's loud and it's terrifying. And when he speaks the Ten Commandments, if you flick over chapter 20, verse 18, the people respond to that by trembling with fear and begging Moses not to let God speak to them. Why? Why is it so terrifying? Why can't they come near? The same reason we can't keep these Ten Commandments. We are sinners. And God, God is holy. That means that God is set apart. Now don't think, whenever we talk about God's holiness, don't think that that's his stern, cold, prickly side. Because what is it that sets God apart from us? It's his goodness. 
He is perfect in every way and he is just and he will punish all evil, including the evil in us. Do you see why it is so dangerous dangerous for us to simply come into his presence. Weak, finite, frail, sinful mortals coming near the holy, good, majestic, eternal God. I heard someone say this past week that God in his holiness is fire and our sin is like petrol. We cannot come close to that fire Otherwise, we'll be completely consumed. So how is God, how is God meant to have a relationship with these people? Answer, the mediator. Mediator means someone who stands in the middle. Someone to bridge the gap. Notice that that is what Moses is doing all throughout Exodus. And he's doing that in this chapter. And in chapter 19, he's constantly going up and down this mountain. I mean, he's an 80-year-old man. I mean, his thighs must have been like tree trunks. But he is the one standing between the people and God. And it's his role that's making this relationship possible. He has a unique role and he has it, of course, because he is a pointer to the greater and better and ultimate mediator that is Jesus. Jesus is a better mediator because he doesn't just go between us and God. He brings us and God together. Do you know the Ten Commandments are not just rules. They're actually a description of Jesus. He kept these commandments perfectly. And that was why he was the only one who could be the sacrifice for our sins, the perfect one who stepped into our place. It's like the petrol of our sin went on him and he was burned by it so that we could be cleansed, so that we could be free from sin, so that we could come into the presence of God. God is still scary, oh yes. (laughs) But we have an unhindered access to him. We have his Holy Spirit. We are his children. And knowing who he is and what he has done motivates us to keep his laws, to listen, to worship, to stand out as this royal priesthood and holy nation. Folks, if you've got a Bible, uh, let me just close by um, getting you to turn to Hebrews 12. Uh, I don't have it on the screen there, but Hebrews chapter 12. And I want to read from verse 18 to 24. It's really important. The book of Hebrews is a really important book for uh, understanding the book of Exodus. But notice what the author does here as we read this passage. He is comparing coming to Mount Sinai with us as Christians coming to what he calls Mount Zion. And Mount Zion, I think, is just really another term for heaven. We have an access to God that they didn't have at Sinai because we have Jesus, the one who died for our sin. So listen to this as we close. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom and storm, to a trumpet blast or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I'm trembling with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Jesus and the blood of Abel. We have come to God because of Jesus because his blood was shed for us and because he is the perfect mediator, his blood cries out to God, speaks to God and says, forgive them, forgive them, give them access. 
And so we come, we listen, and in reverence and worship, we obey. Let me pray. Father, what access we have. How could sinners like us come to a holy God like you? Your, your law shows us just how bad we are, how far we've fallen. And yet, as the hymn says, we boldly approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ our own. It is not because of us that we can approach with such boldness. We approach because Jesus' blood has been shed for us and it cries out for our forgiveness. Our sin has been dealt with and we have that permanent eternal access to you and so we praise you for that. Lord, we've been rescued by grace and would that grace motivate us to live lives of obedience and holiness to you. Father, have mercy and forgive us for we are sinners. Help us turn away in disgust from our sin and turn instead to the life-giving, freeing, wonderful law that is in your word. May we rejoice in it. May we live by it. May we be the kingdom of priests and the holy nation you have called us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're going to sing um, another song, a song that we've not done before. Uh, it's a song by our um, the planting organisation that we are partners with, 20 Schemes, written by them. And it's a wonderful song about how we must flee from our sin and run to Christ. So, uh, We'll sing this song and then I'll do a closing prayer.
Let's close with this prayer from the book of Jude. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God our Saviour be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen.